Welcome to The Well. My name is Stephen Kwan. I am the pastor here at The Well Church Mississauga. And I am so happy that whatever reason you had to click on this service link in YouTube, that you did so and that you're watching this service today. And I invite you, since you've already taken that first step of clicking on the link, to now take another step in preparation of your heart to worship God. You know, let's re remove all the distractions that are all around us. And that might mean your phone or the 20 windows or tabs that you have open on your desktop. And set that aside for the next less than an hour or so uh, to focus on worshiping God. And, and if you are able, to, I encourage you to join us on Zoom as well uh, for the breakouts afterwards. As we have forged ahead on our hashtag WellDisciplined Challenge for the year 2021, uh, a year-long endeavor to incorporate habits of grace into our daily lives and into our worship, we started our series last week on the Lord's Prayer. And with it, we've also started the practice reciting the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer in each service. The reason we pray the Lord's Prayer, it's something that's easy for us to know. You know, we want our prayer to be shaped by the uh, prayer that Jesus taught us. And it shapes the way that we pray in our daily lives outside of the Lord's Prayer as well. The Apostle Creed, however, it can feel a little ritualistic, uh, traditional, um, and, and maybe even a little bit old-fashioned in a time when popular Sunday worship trends away from kind of these ancient creeds. However, throughout history, the church has recited this uh, ancient creed in worship for very good reason. The beliefs that are laid out in the Apostle Creed are designed in a way to highlight the uniqueness of the Christian faith. The reformer Zacharias Ursinus says of it that the Apostles' Creed summarizes effectively the basics of our Christian faith in a way that no non-Christian could possibly recite it. So as we enter into worship today, as we recite the Apostles' Creed together, we remember that our worship is not like any other worship. It's not like any other um, faith or ritual, but it is a uniquely and distinctively Christian worship. That the God we worship is the God of the Bible and revealed in Scripture. And the reasons, the motivations, and the purposes of our worship are distinctively Christian. So today as we pray, as we recite, as we sing, as we listen and respond today in worship, let us be shaped by our faith in the beliefs that are set out by the Apostles' Creed. After reciting the Apostles' Creed, the worship team will come lead us in worship. Let us now confess the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Father, not my will, but yours. 
must be done. So 
Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. All together worthy. All together wonderful to me. And I'll never know. How much it costs to see my sin upon that cross, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Father God, I'd like to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, this privilege to come together online as one body of Christ and worship you, Lord. Lord, we worship, we praise you uh, in all that you are. We worship and praise your greatness, your mercy, your kindness, your love, and your grace. Father God, uh, we lift everything to you. We lay everything before you uh, that we may live continuously dedicated to you, Lord. Uh, I pray for this congregation. I pray for this church. May you build our spirits. May you build our faith in you, Father God. May we continue to strive to be more and more like you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, and in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome, guys, to our Sunday service at the Wall Church Mississauga. We welcome you to our Sunday service that happens every Sunday at uh, 11 a.m. virtually online through YouTube or Zoom. You can find all the links at thewallgta.com slash Sundays. Hi, guys. My name is Hannah. I will share some of the events with the announcements with you. I know um, some of the settings are different, but I just want to, you know, have a change of setting, um, you know, in, in this continued lockdown we are in. And I hope you guys will listen as I share this announcement up close and personal to you guys. And just want to thank the worship team for that wonderful uh, worship service once again. Uh, Jacob, Jenna, and Jin, we thank you for that uh, wonderful worship that we get, quality worship that we get to have every Sunday. Um, so throughout the year, we'll be continuing to do our the Well Discipline Challenge, that we, which I talk about every um, every Sunday. Uh, we might not announce um, everything uh, every week uh, going forward, but we encourage you to continue to check it out uh, for more information about um, the Well Discipline Challenge and also um, the writing the Bible together as a church. So you can go to the website, thewellgta.com slash welldiscipline or thewellgta.com uh, slash wellwrittenbible. And Lent is approaching on Wednesday, the February 17th, and we will announce and communicate some of these things uh, as we have planned for the season. Um, and one thing that we have uh, is to have a book club together um, that has a discussion portion as well online uh, with the book Habit of Grace that um, is one of one of the recommended readings for the Well, um, the well Discipline Challenge. And for five weeks on Mondays, starting on the 22nd of February, so if you're interested in that, um, you can go to the uh, you can go to the wellgta.com slash links to find the link to sign up for the uh, book club. Uh, it is open for everybody, um, but uh, those who sign up, we will share the questions uh, beforehand. And now we'll go into the time of giving. At this time, we will take it through e-transfer. If it's your first time giving, please write your full name and address, and then we'll add it to the tax donation um, contributions for 2021. And now I will pass off the video to Pastor Stefan, and he will give us more updates about the well discipline um, and also lead us into the Lord's Prayer as well. And you guys know it. I'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you, Hannah, for the announcements. Uh, I just wanted to highlight one thing before we get into the message today about the hashtag well discipline challenge. And as we are going through the series on the Lord's Prayer together, uh, one of the 
um, goals of this series is to have you memorize the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's one of our challenges and um, just to kind of show that you have done so, uh, we want to receive your videos um, of you reciting the Lord's Prayer. It, it'll be really short. Just take it on your cell phone and send it to me. We'll be using the version of the Lord's Prayer that we recite today in our YouTube service. So the words to that will be in the description uh, below the video. Uh, if you do use the older version with the thys and the thous and the arts, uh, that's okay. Uh, we might just edit out a little bit of the clips and we want to compile this together for our Easter service. So uh, please send those videos to thewellgta at gmail.com or you can send them to my personal cell phone and I'll have that downloaded as well. Uh, and I look forward to having you guys memorize the Lord's Prayer and more than that, as you guys memorize it and make it part of your heart, that that will shape the way that you pray in your daily and personal prayer. Now, before we go into the service, let us pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to come before you and gather in worship. Although the idea of gathering is online, we know that your spirit, Lord, uh, connects us as we listen to your word, as we sit under uh, the same teaching and lift up the same songs that we are united in one heart and one mind. I pray, Father, as we uh, listen to your word, will you open up our hearts as we look into your uh, the prayer that your son taught us, uh, that we will be able to allow that to form and shape our hearts, that we will have that same relationship, Father Lord, that we'll have that same uh, connection to you as we cry out to you in prayer as your son did. And I pray, Father, through the grace of the Holy Spirit, Father Lord, that we will be able to uh, live uh, with power, that we'll be live uh, with faith, that we'll be live in a way that honors and glorifies your name in everything that we do. So I pray that you open up our hearts right now May we receive your word and may you sanctify us by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, all church. Today we continue on in our series on the Lord's Prayer. Last week we had the wonderful privilege of having uh, Reverend Dr. Ross Lockhart from Vancouver kicking off our series on the Lord's Prayer. He did a great job of setting it up. Uh, to pray, not pay attention. Among other things, as he looked through the first part of the prayer, Our Father in Heaven, he pointed out that we are able to approach God the Father as our Father because Jesus is the firstborn brother because of his invitation. The hour is made up of Jesus and ourselves. I heard a lecture this past week saying that when Jesus called God his Father, it wasn't a radical reimagining of the relationship between God and his people, the Jews, that the Jewish people of his time understood God as Father. Um, however, you know the, God, the Old Testament does call God our Father. It's mentioned about 15 times throughout the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, by the end of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, God is called Father over 150 times. And maybe it is true that, that it was more common in the first century to call God Father and that the language of the Father is a product of those times. But it is only with Jesus that we are truly able to call God our Father in the, in the truest sense of the word, that we are part of His literal family adopted in as the children of God. God is our Father in heaven. Today, we will look at what is called the first petition, Hallowed be your name. And so let me read you the passage on the Lord's Prayer once more from Matthew chapter 6, starting from verse 5 to 15. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, 
for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord's Prayer can be breaking down into its petitions with a invocation, uh, our Father in Heaven at the beginning and the doxology at the end. And that's the way we're going to look at it in our series. And, and you can imagine that, you know, preachers and theologians and, and Christians have broken this, you know, broken this prayer down uh, to no end throughout history. John Calvin, the, the father of the Reformed tradition of which we are a part, organized this petition into two parts of three. The first three having to do with God alone and the latter half having to do what God does in our lives through salvation. And uh, I recently heard uh, John Piper's sermon uh, preaching on this petition and said this was the only petition that requests something in our heart rather than something external to it. And that instead of three and three, it is actually one and five. That this petition is the only petition really and that the other five are, are, are deeper description of the petition. However you organize the petitions, one thing is clear. That it is a petition. That it's something that we are asking God. You know, sometimes we can get down on ourselves because our prayers are all about asking God for something. And, and I'm guilty of it too. A lot of my prayers are requests before God. And I'm also guilty of saying that it shouldn't be like that. But when we see the Lord's Prayer, much of the prayer are petitions, requests of God. And now, it shouldn't all be about asking God. We should pray to God acknowledging who God is and praising His name and yeah, as He is due, as we will see in the doxology at the end. But the problem in many of our prayers lies not in the quantity of our petitions, not in the fact that we are asking God for things all the time, but rather in the content of our petitions and the heart of our petitions. that We are asking God for the wrong things for the wrong reasons. And even when we ask for the right things, sometimes we do that for the wrong reasons. So the act of asking God is not the problem in and of itself. We see it here in this first petition. Hallowed be your name. It is a petition. It's a request. We are asking God that his name be hallowed. And some modern transition, uh, translations change the hallowed to holy. But it's not holy is your name. Because that's a statement. It's not a petition. It's a statement. It's holy be your name. Now, what are we asking here? Well, what is Jesus showing us or telling us to ask God as he teaches us this prayer? And what is he asking us to ask God in this petition? Are we asking that God's name be holy or, or hallowed because somehow God is not yet there. He's deficient in it. Like when we ask God, Lord, make me patient because in our current state now, we are not patient. So we're asking God to make us so. Is that what we're ha what's happening when we're asking God's name to be holy? No, no by, by no means. God doesn't need our prayer for his name to be holy. God doesn't need this prayer. God doesn't need the Lord's prayer. Jesus isn't saying that we need to pray so that God can be made holy. God's name is holy. God is holy with or without our prayers. God's name is hallowed. So then what, what are we actually praying for? What, what are we actually asking? Well, maybe we need to lay down some definitions, right? Well, what does it mean to hallow something? The dictionary definition from Merriam-Webster says this, uh, it's a verb, and to make holy or to set apart for holy use, uh, or to respect greatly. Another nuance of it is, is to honor as holy, to make uncommon, 
to to make something special, which which helps us understand what it means to actually make something holy. So when we pray, hallowed be your name, we recognize that we don't make God holy, but rather we are asking that God's name be hallowed in us, in our heart. And that's the point that John Piper was, was making, that uh, this petition asks God to do something inside of us, that we would regard God as holy, that we would cherish Him as holy, that we would treasure Him as holy. Something completely uncommon, something completely special and utterly unique, something that has no comparison. In Exodus 3.5, when, we, uh, when God speaks and calls to Moses from the burning bush, he tells him, Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing, where you are standing is holy ground. The ground that Moses was on was completely special and unique. Not because of the composition or its placement and location in, in the geography of the land, but because it was a place where God's presence was. And because God was holy, that is, He was utterly special and unique, when He, uh, when he was present on that land, on that space, that ground became holy as well. And later on in this story, God reveals His name to Moses and, and the people of Israel. In verse 14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. When Moses is unsure of you know, his ability to lead the people out, God gives him this personal name, the personal name of God revealed to Israel. I am who I am, Yahweh. You know, this name, Yahweh, I am who I am, it's, it's a name, but also it's a non-name at the same time. Like if someone asks you, who are you? And you tell them, I am who I am. You're not saying anything about yourself. You aren't revealing anything about yourself to the person that is asking. But when God says it to Moses, the name itself doesn't reveal anything about who God is, about his character, like some of the other names of God, which describe his qualities, describe his attributes. Like when we call God Father or Shepherd or Healer or Provider, we're, we're describing what God is like. But when he says Yahweh, I am who I am. That points to the utter distinctiveness of God. God is beyond our, our comprehension. God is free from the limits of our language and our conceptual capabilities. That any, uh, any description, uh, any word that we might use is insufficient to understand the true nature of God. All names and, and descriptions that we place on God are limited by what we can understand. But God, God is beyond that. God, He is God without us. And another way to translate Yahweh is, I will be who I will be. Like, I'm going to be me. You can't control God. You can't control Him. You can't limit Him. As the prophet Isaiah says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is completely and utterly beyond our comprehension and understanding. That's why it's kind of ridiculous when people object to the Bible or object to what Scripture says and say, you know, God wouldn't be like that. If God is loving, He wouldn't do that. Or if God was just, He wouldn't allow that. As if those concepts of love and justice, righteousness, fairness, peace, Patience, all these attributes that we give these human words to, these human definitions to, as if God was bound by that. When we say God is love, we are saying that love is defined by whatever God is. Whatever God is, that's what love is. The word love in, in all its connotations don't define God. Rather, it's the other way around. God defines what love is. And you can say the same thing about justice or forgiveness, or righteousness, or any of the qualities that we attribute to God. The words don't define God. God defines those words. And we use those words to try to understand God. And in that way, all words, all words that we use for uh, God, they're analogies. So I think by now I've pressed that point enough that 
uh, you know, I've beaten it into your hearts and into your minds that God's name is holy. You know, God's name needs nothing from us to be holy. God is holy in and of God's self. Why then do we need to hallow God's name? What does that mean? We need to hallow God's name because God's name is not seen as holy by us or by those around us. John Calvin says this, The necessity of presenting it bespeaks our great disgrace. For what can be more unbecoming than that our ingratitude and malice should impair our audacity and petulance should as much as in them lies destroy the glory of God? Hence the necessity of this petition, which if piety had any proper existence among us, would be superfluous. Now, John Calvin wrote hundreds of years ago, and, and if the translation of that text is difficult to understand, what it's saying simply is this, that if we had any idea of who God actually was or what he was like, we wouldn't need to pray this petition. The reason we need to hallow God's name is because our sin obscures the glory of God. We aren't able to recognize and acknowledge God as He is due. You know, one thing that is really annoying about, you know, wearing glasses is that when they get dirty, you need to wipe them with a cloth or, or at the very least your clothes. And, you know, if you've ever been in the situation where they get dirty and or, or it's raining and, and your glasses get wet and everything is wet and so your clothes are wet and your hands are wet and so whatever you wipe your glasses with is not actually making it any better. Now think of that situation not with water but with like black paint or mud. You know, no matter how much you wipe, you can't clean them with dirty things. We need outside help to get them clean. And that's what we're doing when we pray, Hallowed be your name. The glory of God is obscured from us by our own sin, by our own pride. And the filth and the stain of our sin runs too deep. It's everywhere. and it's, We can't do anything about it. So we have to pray. We must pray, Hallowed be your name. Because we can't do it in our own power. It's what we're called to do. It's what we're created to do. And the Bible says if we don't do it, the rocks will do so. And that's why you see, whenever you see something beautiful in creation, it hits your heart because the glory of God is being proclaimed. It's being hallowed. It's being shown to you. But even the most beautiful scene in nature, the, the most heartwarming picture of humanity, the the best example of, of human goodness does not come close to seeing the glory of God in all its holiness. So we have to pray it. Lord, may I regard your name with the veneration that it is due, with the proper admiration, the proper respect. Lord, there's none like you. Nothing can compare to you. Lord, may I hallow your name in everything that I do. I can't do it in my power. So I pray, you know, in the name of Jesus, that through him, that Christ in me will glorify your name in and through my life. You know, if you can catch that heart, that is enough. But if you will indulge me for just a little bit further to speak on some of the implications of this prayer in our lives, the Westminster Short, Shorter Catechism states this in dealing with the Lord's Prayer. In the first request, hallowed be your name, we pray that God will enable us and others to glorify Him in everything He uses to make Himself known and that He will work everything to His own glory. So when we pray this, we're not praying just that God's name will be hallowed in our hearts, but we're praying that for the people for, around us, for our workplaces, for our families and our schools, for all of our communities and our entire world, that God's name will be hallowed. That all people will know and show in their lives and in their worship that God is holy. That in everything I do, in everything my neighbor does, in everything that you do, we will glorify God. It's not confined to us. It's not confined to me and, and, and as I pray it. But we pray this for the world. 
And when we do so, when we do this, it, it's something that is inherently countercultural. You know, I'm not sure that uh, this prayer would take on this kind of meaning in, in other generations, but it is a prayer that is selfless. And I'm sure throughout history, people have prayed uh, sh selfish prayers. It's a human trait that we pray for the things that benefit us. We are limited in our understanding of God and of His glory in this way. It's because of the sin that we are like that. And even when our prayers aren't selfish per se, they're often self-centered or, or self-focused. When we pray, hallowed be your name, we declare the utter uniqueness of God. We, we declare that God is special. And in our generations, the descriptions of unique and special, distinctive, these words are most of often applied not to God, but to ourselves. We have been told that we are special. We have been told that you are unique. And, and it's not that that's not true. It, it is, of course, true. But that's not the point. You know, when, when we talk about our uniqueness, our uniqueness is commonplace. If everyone is unique, then no one is. The uniqueness of every person is exactly what makes them the same as others. But God is utterly beyond all comprehension and truly unique in a way that is different, far different from the uniqueness of human individuals. This world, our society, spends so much time hallowing ourselves, making ourselves unique, making ourselves distinct, that we become gods in our own eyes. You know, no one can tell us what to do no one can tell us how to feel except ourselves. Our, our freedom to choose, our freedom to act in whatever way we like, our freedom to pursue our desires, that defines us. But when we pray, hallowed be your name, we are saying that our holiness, our uniqueness is nothing in comparison to God's. Actually, our holiness is from God himself being made in His image, being wonderfully and fearfully made, being called by name, being fully known by God. And we decenter ourselves and put God at the center of our lives. And by praying it, we ask that God would be the center of all life. When we pray, hallowed be your name, John Calvin says, we ask that the glory of God may shine in the world and may duly be acknowledged by man. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and give, it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I pray that through your lives, God's name will be hallowed in all the earth. Let us pray. Father, I pray that you will be hallowed in our lives. Not that we need to make you holy, Father Lord, but that we will see you as holy. We would acknowledge you as holy, that we will worship you as holy, utterly and completely different and set apart from us. And I pray, Father Lord, that in our actions, that we will show that we believe that you are holy. In our decisions, that we will decide uh, in ways that make you holy, that make you distinct. As we follow you and as we uh, you know, seek your kingdom, as we do everything, Father Lord, may we proclaim to this world that you are holy. And as we do so, Lord, may your name be hallowed in our neighbor's life. As we hallow your name, Father Lord, may your name be hallowed in our co-worker's life, in our uh, professor, in our fellow student's life, in, in, our, uh, in, in our families, Lord. May your name be hallowed as we hallow your name in all the earth. That our actions as your people, as your sons and your daughters, as your church, as your holy people, Father, will display not our 
holiness, but yours. And Father, Lord, that is impossible for us to do. So we pray for your spirit to come and to give us the strength to make your name holy. Hallowed be your name in all the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We will close the service with the Lord's Prayer and a benediction. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May the name of our Father be hallowed in your life. As you approach his glory through the grace and mediation of our Lord Jesus Christ, may you pray this boldly. And by the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, through you, may the name of the Father be hallowed by every person around you, that all creation will regard God as he deserves because of the witness of Jesus in your life, now and forever. Amen.